Um, so, okay, we'll, uh, we'll officially start. We'll, uh, we've opened the doors. People have sat down. Uh, they've hopefully had a coffee and uh, they're ready to, uh, to, to participate in the, uh, the, the masterclass. So this is the second in the series of uh, masterclasses and they're taking us on this smart town journey. Many of you will have attended previous workshops, um, but for those who haven't, I'm David Griffith and I'm from Mentermon. And however, I'm here today on behalf of the Enterprise Hub. Now, the Enterprise Hub is a Welsh government program providing business support for startups in Northwest Wales. However, we are arranging these workshops in partnership with Welsh government as part of their Transforming Towns agenda. Uh, we have been increasingly involved in smart towns and smart technology over the last uh, few years. And uh, almost a year ago, we, we started collecting footfall data in eight towns in Gwynedd. That data is available on, on Patrum. But what do we do with that data? How can we use it? Uh, we have been following the excellent work of Clive Davis in Abertavi, who has used data to add value to the excellent regen work already going on there. And aligning data with regen is critical. However, I think it's fair to say that we've got a long way to go in towns in, in Wales. Moving forward, the Welsh government are very eager uh, that smart technology should be embraced um, and help our high streets recover as we move forward. It is uh, for this reason, Welsh Government asked us to coordinate these, this set of smart, uh, smart masterclasses. Um, this, as I said, allows, aligns with the Transforming Towns agenda, which will be, uh, which will, and there will be a grant scheme opening in April available to towns throughout Wales. The grant scheme will provide flexible package of support, which included support for, for towns to adopt digital technology and become smarter towns. Therefore, these masterclasses will be useful for those towns thinking of applying for that support. The scheme is currently being finalized and more information will be available shortly. Our first masterclass focused on the why. Why create a smart town? We are now moving to the what. And we have been joined today by three expert speakers who are leaders in their fields. We are fortunate to have the support of Linda Chandler, throughout the series and she will be shortly provide context for this masterclass and she will also facilitate the Q&A session. Linda is a director with Hyperlocal and is a global smart city advisor. In a previous life, she was, she was also a smart cities lead with Microsoft. Now I would encourage all the uh, members of the audience to use the Q&A function um, to pose questions. We will respond to these at the end, but we'll also keep a record of all the questions and circulate answers, even if we are unable to do so live. And it will inform future discussions around these masterclasses and beyond. So we have circulated the, the, uh, the full agenda with the bios for the speakers in the chat. The, we have very impressive speakers. They have been very impressive biographies, um, but I would allow, I'd allow you to read the bios at your leisure. Otherwise I'll take up the whole session talking about the fantastic work they've already done. So on that, I will transfer the reins to Linda. Thank you, Linda. Okay, great. Thanks, David. I just wanted to get a, give a bit of context um, for this Smart Town series. As David said, um, the overall aim of the webinar series is to explore the why, the what, and the how of smart towns. And so in the first webinar, uh, we looked at some principles of, of smart towns that were derived really from the smart cities agenda. And we looked at the various pillars of smart cities and some of the big trends that are happening in society, such as the future of the high street, the future of work and the future of aging. We heard in the first seminar from Wendy Robertson from Aberdeen on why they became a smart city. And she emphasized this multi-agency approach and collaborative framework that's needed amongst all the stakeholders. And, and that's a theme that will come up again and again. We also heard from Stephen Meredith, um, a bit closer to home for you from Digital Cardiff. And he went into quite a lot of detail on two initiatives around smart, smart bins and smart, smart lighting in terms of what the actual effects of those and the outcomes uh, were of those um, initiatives. But he also touched on some of the challenges of actually starting to create data repositories around the idea of a smart town or city. 
And we also heard from Steve Turner from the Connected Places Catapult, and he talked about the social and economic benefits of being a smart town and, and talked about how data is uh, coming very much into vogue and focus around hard infrastructure, around transport and energy, but also around the softer infrastructure and how we can use data to bring the community together around crowdsourcing initiatives. And we also uh, were joined by Clive um, again from the uh, from the, the, the mayor of Cardigan um, last time on the panel, um, and uh, and it, it was great to to hear his kind of take on our, our speakers for that. Um, and I think we can all agree that smart technology or smart cities shouldn't start with the technology. It's very much the enabler, and a lot of people are seeing tech as that route to economic recovery. And so we come to today's session, um, which is starting on our what part of the smart cities or smart towns journey. And very much um, we're going to talk about um, spatial data and social data and actually how that can really aid understanding um, and decision making within smart towns. We're going to start to look at translating that kind of physical to digital and how we can generalize behavior from various attributes of the, the physical space but also looking at that digital to physical perspective and the relationship, the relationship between um, online social and high street footfall. Um, so I'll hand back to David and I'm really looking forward to our panel of speakers today, thanks. Uh, well, thank you, Linda. It's, um, so our first speaker is, uh, is Ed Parham um, and Ed is the uh, design director and Head of Innovation with Space Syntax. The title of the talk is Spatial Tools to, to Better Manage Places. So with that, I'll hand over to Ed. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm gonna just share my screen and hopefully everybody, can you see that now? Should be coming through. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. So um, there we go. So I'm Ed Parman from Space Syntax. We're an SME based in London. We were a spin out from UCL originally about 30 years ago, and we're now employee owned. What we're really interested in is the way that the design of the built environment affects day to day behavior, the way that has long term outcomes. And our particular focus is on the use of modeling, um, taking the urban systems, the, the, those hard infrastructure systems, analyzing how they fit together so we can understand those relationships and the way they relate to outcomes. So to give you an example of this, people might have seen this. It was a story on the BBC website two years ago now. Um, people had just saved up to buy their first home, but they were really unhappy because they spent the whole time in the car driving everywhere. There was a paper in the British Medical Journal a couple of years ago as well, and that identified associations between um, higher risk of obesity in people that commuted to work by car. So if you took public or active transport, you had a 10% lower risk of developing obesity. There was more research last year that looked at the secondary impacts of, the, of driving on society and how actually for every kilometer you drive that has a cost to society, but cycling and walking generate benefits. Now, what we're really interested in at Space Syntax is how we can analyze the underlying urban systems and we can see how that enables certain daily behaviors to happen or not happen. And the way that we do that, we use spatial data. It's really, it's about the hard infrastructure systems. The, the origin of the company at UCL was about taking the, the street networks of cities and analyzing the, the connectivity of those networks. And you can, from that analysis, you can understand how people move through a city where they're more likely to be. And so you can predict pedestrian movement and vehicular movement. That has then secondary impacts in terms of where particular land uses need to be. If you know where people are, things like shops traditionally have needed to be close to people. E-commerce is um, testing that a bit, but you really need to have access to customers. And so what you find in most cities is that I think the statistic for London is that 80 percent of the shops are on the top 20 percent of the best connected spaces. So that was the, the core technology that we've been um, using on real world projects. In the last five ish, maybe seven years, there's been big developments in technology in terms of the amount of data that's available, software, there's open source software, uh, there's better hardware, 
lots of graduates can now code in a way that they couldn't before. And what that means is that you can build bigger models and they're more complicated. You can analyze them quicker. And that's interesting to people who are kind of really technical. But the key question in this is, so what? And the big benefit that we're finding is that it's a bit um, counterintuitive, but a more complicated model can actually give you an answer that you don't need to be trained to understand. So this is what we call an integrated urban model. And we take the street network, we link it to land use data, um, we take public transport timetable data, and we, we turn that into a network and use that to connect the land uses to each other. We can link it to census data as well. What that means is that you can ask questions that will make sense to somebody who lives in a city. So we can say for every house in a city, how many jobs could I get to in half an hour? How does that change if I can only use a car, if I can use public transport? Can I get to a good school or a doctor? And to show that in a bit more detail, what I've got here is a model of Milton Keynes. And we have looked at every house and we've looked at what the advantage of having a car is. Now these dark blue houses, they can get to five times more jobs by car in half an hour than by public or active transport. So we can start to pick out the parts of the town where there is more of a problem. We can go into that in more detail because the model has got the different layers of infrastructure. We've got the street network, public transport and land use. We could start to investigate how to change that. So we might be able to say, if we just looked at the street network, could we, would a new street through here help um, reduce the dependence of having a car? But we know that actually adding streets to existing cities is really difficult. It's slow, it's expensive, and it's really unpopular. So maybe you could, you could rule it out. You could look at, we can go into more detail about the land use, and we could say, could we get more land use in this part of the city? You might be able to do that, but again, it might take time. You can then go into public transport and say, could we get a bus route to come through here? But again, because we've got those other bits of data in the model, we can start to see, does it have the density to support a bus route? Does the length, the additional length that the bus would have to go on through those extra bits of street network, does that make it possible to run a bus through there? So we can start to um, interrogate each of these underlying characteristics to see what is and what isn't possible and what's contributing to this characteristic. A lot of the time we, we show the data as maps because we're using it in a planning context, but not always. Um, and we pull out the data in other formats when we need to. So this graph is showing basically the number of jobs here you can get to by car compared to the number by public and active transport. And we've got an existing public transport mode share here, which is 10%. Now, Milton Keynes were really interested in seeing, could we test their 20, I think it was 2037 plan. So we took the model, we updated it, added in the new connections, the land use, the density, public transport. They had a target mode share of 45% public transport. To hit that mode share, you would want to see the gap between these two peaks get smaller. So you'd want to see the advantage of having a car become less. When we reran the model and updated it, um, we actually found the gap between those two peaks got even bigger. So the advantage of having a car in future becomes even bigger than it is today, which makes it really difficult to hit that public transport uh, mode share. Now, when we make the models, we put it together in a way that it can be coordinated with census data. And what that means is we can run other um, models using that data. So here we've zoomed out on Milton Keynes and we're looking at a wider area. The blue is still showing car dependence. And what we've got in different shades of gray in the background is a it's an age UK model of um, looking at the risk of social isolation in the elderly people. So the darker the gray means that the, the population who lives there have got the characteristics that are associated with elderly people who might be lonely. You can then use this to see where are those um, more potentially vulnerable populations and do they live in parts of the city where you have to have a car to get to things and you can use that as a kind of a double um, red flag to see where are the areas we need to look at in more detail and how should we prioritize the way that we deliver services to these areas we did a bit of work um, looking we, we worked on an nhs healthy new town with exeter and that was really interested in what are the what are the long-term health outcomes and how does that relate to urban form? We worked with the public health department, we gave them a model. This is a different characteristic we're looking at here. We're looking at something called walkability, and that's the, the, the way the street grid fits together at the scale of a person and the mix of land uses that you've got within a 10-minute walk. 
the red streets are the ones where you've got a bigger mix of uses and the blue is there's fewer uses within 10 minutes. Um, we gave that to the public health department. They had health data that at that point we weren't allowed. And this is their correlation matrix. And what they started to find was that they had higher levels of obesity associated with lower levels of walkability. And there's, there's really interesting, really helpful stuff that comes out of this. And it's in some ways, it's the, the public health department validating the model. There's a really interesting conversation around causation and correlation, which we maybe haven't got time to go into now, but we could pick up in the Q&A. Um, we also, we, we made an integrated urban model of Britain. This was finished in about September. And we did some work with the Prince's Foundation and Knight Frank. This report was published just before Christmas. I think it was December, maybe end of November. And one of the really interesting pieces in there was that the measure of walkability that we found in Exeter related to positive health outcomes was also associated with higher rateable values of properties. So what's really nice linking those two pieces of work together is that the same underlying urban characteristics of the way the street grid, the land use, the public transport, all of those things fit together to make places easy to walk around or move around without having a car are associated with positive health outcomes and positive economic or um, value outcomes. So that's a quick introduction to integrated urban models and the way they fit together. And the way that we really apply them is in two kind of key applications. One is to design better new places. And I'll show this in a minute. And the other is to manage existing places better. Now, we were invited to a master plan competition for the capital of Kazakhstan about three years ago. Um, we won the competition by using our models to analyze cities around the world that delivered positive outcomes and to take those characteristics and code them in a computer program that would allow us to grow an urban form that made it possible to walk, to cycle, that was associated with higher values. Um, that was the competition entry. This was what won. And this was the actual master plan that we um, finished in about September, I think. Now, the last bit, the last example I was going to show you was um, one of the things that we recognize is that not all cities are growing, not all cities are physically changing. But we know that the spatial infrastructure and the, the, the hard infrastructure underneath the city or within a city or a place or a town is really influential on what happens day to day. One of the things that we want to do is to use that to help people to manage places better. So if you can see that there are parts of the city that present a higher risk, they're more difficult to get to the things that you need to using a car, you haven't got access to the services that you need. We want to be able to use that to identify where there are higher risks, where there are um, lower risks. Now this was a project where it was um, Innovate UK and Newton Fund, or Newton funded. It was to work with Sao Paulo and it was to help make a tool that allowed city planners to improve the lives of elderly people in the city. So what we're really interested in is removing the technical barriers to our model so that people can use that to see where are the parts of the city that are more difficult to live in and why are they like this. The thing that we added to this that was really unique was that um, there were five kind of, there was, there was an overall score of how livable different parts of the city were. And we broke that down to explain how easy was it to have social interactions physical activity, could you get to the health services you needed? Could you get to public transport? And we started to introduce in that variation according to the level of physical health and the level of income. What that meant that the planners could do was to ask a series of questions. They could see how quality of life in different parts of the city changed depending on how far you could walk in 10 minutes, um, what income level you could be at and how that affected what modes of transport you had access to. Um, this is a tool that is live and it's it's online here at the moment. We did it for two, two small parts of San Paolo. And um, that's really about trying to deploy our modeling and technology in a slightly different area to normal. And it's about how can you deliver things on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is a very quick summary of the work that we do. Um, and I think that the real kind of core point to finish on, I think, is to say what we're really interested in is not just seeing what's happening where, 
but by analyzing the underlying systems, the street networks, the land use of public transport, we can explain why particular things happen in different parts of the city. And when you can understand that, you can either change it or you can mitigate it. So at that point, I'm going to hand back and um, yeah, we'll pick up any questions. Okay. Um, thank, thank you, Ed. Um, fascinating. Um, I was going to ask one question of each, each speaker and then we can take others into the panel. And there are a few that we will take into the panel. Uh, but one simple question is how well can you use this system in a rural area? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, we can. We've got it. We've got it analysed for the whole of Britain at the moment. And what it will, it doesn't. It doesn't make a difference between whether you're in a rural area or an urban area. But what it will start to do is you'll be able to really clearly explain the differences of what it's like to live in those different places. So you'll be able to see if you lived in the centre of Milton Keynes, um, you might be um, much less car dependent than if you live in a village on the outskirts. You probably have, um, if you live in a village on the outskirts, you have less good access or, or you have less choice of the services you can access and those kind of questions. So we can start to quantify that and really explain it. Thank you very much. Uh, there are more questions in the chat. We'll come back to them in the Q&A. So um, thank you, Ed. And now we're moving on to uh, our next speaker, um, Dr. Sharon Richardson, who is a senior special scientist and lecturer uh, in geocomputation at the University of Zurich, and she joined Zurich uh, just before Christmas. Um, the title of her talk is Learning the Social Heartbeat of an Urban Landscape with Real-Time Data. So thank you very much. Over to you, Sharon. Okay, thank you, and I will also just, uh, let's get my screen shared. Hopefully everyone can see that. Great, thanks for the nods, <laughs> always appreciated. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is almost the next layer up from what we've just heard about from Ed, and it's looking at how we can use mobile data to reveal social atmospheres. So bringing time into our study of space, how does the atmosphere of a location change at different times of day, at different times of year and so forth? And if you just look at this photo on screen, it's a couple walking down a street, Instantly, we can look at this and make a judgment that it's probably autumn or winter time because they're wearing coats. It looks quite grey and damp. Uh, it looks like there's possibly a market down the left hand side. There's quite a few people around. How typical is this scene of this space? Is it like this all the time? Uh, is it more crowded in the summer or less crowded? It can go both ways, depending on different land uses. And for me, this is the real potential of mobile data is we can start to get temporal patterns to understand where we start with a baseline average, how much variation we can see in a space. Different data sources can give us all sorts of different information. But today I'm just gonna talk through a couple of examples around presence, how many people are present and potentially what are they doing? I'm going to use a single landscape uh, as an example here, which is the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in Stratford, East London. It's where I did a lot of my research for my doctorate. And if we just look at the map here, you should be familiar, have heard of it at least from the London 2012 Olympics. But since the Olympics, it's been redeveloped and it's now very much a pivotal part of a very built up area. So it's surrounded by a lot of residential, commercial, retail districts. It's a very large park. You know, and the intention is to understand better how the park is used. And hopefully this animation is starting to show up on screen. I'm always slightly nervous with a video. Can everyone see that playing? Thank you. So what we're seeing here is mobile app data. The green dots are mobile devices that have visited this landscape at least three times during a month. The purple dots are devices that visited maybe once or twice. And it's just showing the, the connection of the device readings on an hourly basis throughout the whole month of June 2017. And just as we play it, we get that heartbeat of day to night rhythm going through. But we also see flare ups for different events taking place throughout the daytime, through the weeks and through into the weekends. And I'm just watching the counter up to the 15th of June. So you can see it's quite green at the moment. And it's about to go very purple, <laughs> there we go. And so that were the two Guns N' Roses concerts that took place uh, on those two days at the park. So we can see we get a real different population in the park when we have things like these music concerts taking place. So it's really interesting data to look at, but we need to turn it into some kind of insight. How do we actually act with these sorts of data? And so I argue that we need to define the location-based context that we're interested in. 
And we start with that spatial baseline. And actually, this is the bit we don't need the mobile data for. We've just seen what we need the, for, for getting that spatial baseline. We need to do a thorough spatial analysis. But from that baseline, mobile data can give us two different time dimensions. It can give us the temporal dynamics. And these are the regular rhythms, the day to night, the week to weekend, the summer to winter, the recurring holidays, Easter, Christmas, things that happen on an annual basis. You know, these rhythms, give us a, a, a certain dynamic with some regularity, some consistency. But on top of that, there are the adaptions, the abnormal conditions, the one-off events, the incidents, the emergencies, the extreme weather events, and these create changes from those temporal rhythms. But across both of them also is a reaction sensitivity. You know, we always need to, to appreciate that when we're capturing real-time data, we don't have a complete picture because people do react differently. Some people in the winter, if it's an ex unexpectedly warm day, will go to the park, we go. Others will be like, that's winter, I don't go to the park in the winter. So not, you know, not all reactions are the same. We have to allow a certain amount of human nature kicks in here and gives us plenty of uncertainty. But by starting to build this structure in, we can develop a framework and then we're starting to measure this data and turn it into some insights. So if we're interested in a particular population behavior, we get that spatial baseline, we learn that cyclic dynamics, so we can start to understand and start to predict behavior for regular conditions, but also learn how much variation we get in those abnormal conditions. Are they the same for all events? Do music concerts have a different uh, temporal footprint compared to say football matches at the London Stadium in the park and absolutely they're at different times of day they've got different durations so we can start to quantify it in, in a way that we can be quite rigorous about and so I'm just going to talk through two examples using the park the first one is well how many people are in the park you know it's quite difficult to know if we look at just this cell here that I've highlighted in red how many people do we think are there if we, consult, if we consult the census, you know, it's the most authoritative source on population data, it will give us a big fat zero because there are no residential properties in that space. And for those that are aware that we have a workday population since the 2011 census, also zero because parks aren't included in the rezoning for workday activities. So administrative data doesn't help us. Now, there are ambient sources, and this grid of which this cell's highlighted from is from a, a source called LandScan. They've divided the whole planet up into a grid of uniform cells, and they've attempted an ambient average. So they've taken residential data, but also land use information, transport information, satellite imagery, to try and come up with a more ambient average to reflect those spaces that aren't purely residential. And they think there's about 6,000 people here at any given time of any given day. But contextually, we know there could be at least up to 80,000, if not more. For the London Stadium, its capacity is 70,000 for music concerts. It's 50 to 60,000 for football and athletics events. Uh, but allowing for other people as well, we could potentially go up to 100,000 people at a time in this space. And this is where the mobile data can help. And this table that you're seeing here is a way of converting that ambient average that LandScan provides into an actual real number of people, because we know we can't just count mobile devices and say, well, we had 50 devices, so that's 50 people, because we know not everybody is using the app. We know there's a lot more than that. So we use the mobile data as a weighting to create our population estimate. We take our spatial baseline, which is the LandScan ambient average, and then we multiply it by a time weight that we generate from the mobile data. And in this table, so that first line, that's our spatial baseline, that's the S part of the star model. So LandScan estimates, it's a bit precise for my liking, 5,907 people on average, so let's say roughly 6,000. But using the mobile data, we learn that at 10 o'clock in the morning on a typical Friday with no events, it drops down to just a third. And we've ground truth that if you go to the park in the mornings, it's, it's a pretty quiet place. But at 6 p.m. on a Friday, around about you know, peak commute time, it's increased by over two thirds because it's actually a lot of people traverse the park to get from places of work and transport hubs across to residential areas. So we, have, we see quite a significant increase. And then on an event day, we're seeing an order of magnitude increase in volume and not just the increase, but we're also seeing that shift in pattern in terms of regulars to tourists. And actually these numbers are conservative because we came out with 55,000 when we were hoping for more like 70,000. So we're nowhere out 
but it's an improvement on zero for the admin data or a complete static number that doesn't have any variation for the types of abnormalities that we know can take place in this space. The second example is to say, well, that tells us roughly how many people we think are in this space at a given time, but it doesn't tell us necessarily what they're doing. And another aspect that mobile data can give us that's not easily sourced elsewhere is to get a feel for dwell and movement patterns. So if you look at the image on the left, these are the raw data points from the mobile data set. So they're just plotted in, I've just snipped it to a boundary covering the park and Westfield Stratford, the big retail center that drops right to the edge of it. As expected, you can see you've got this black mass, a lot of points are generated there. There's big transport hubs, there's lots of retail, it's like the biggest shopping center in Europe. Um, and we can see some pathways in that marked out across the park. Now, I'm not going to go <laughs> in 10 minutes of time, I'm not going to go into the details of all the maths and the machine learning in the background. But what we do is analyze the mobile data to define different active hotspots around the, uh, the landscape. And then once we've got those active spaces, we measure the movements of devices going in and out of those active spaces. So how long are they in the active space for before they move on to another one? They can come back to it. That would be a new part of their trip, for example. And then what we've done is color coded them. So you can see the blue lines across on the right hand side. If my mugshot and everybody else's isn't completely blocking the image on your screens, the blue go across the park, that's traveling. So people are, are definitely in motion. But then we've got two types of dwell time. We've got what I've called as brief and dwell time, which is five to 20 minutes, 20 to 90 minutes. So these are likely to be ad hoc visits. It could be lunch breaks. It could be pausing, waiting to catch a bus. Whereas the red and the orange are longer visits. These are far more likely to be intentional visits. You know, they're up to four hours. That's attending a music concert or a football match, four to six hours, you could be at the athletics championships that take place all day in the park. And what's interesting in the Westfield area, which I actually can't see, so because I've got all the pictures over it, I'm hoping some can, if not, I'll, uh, I'll pull it out in the Q&A. But in Westfield, we can see that the majority in the cluster of the retail area is dwelling between 20 to 90 minutes, so shopping trips. There's some red clusters there for longer durations, but then at the top and the bottom of the retail areas, we see the brief of five to 20 minutes, which makes sense because that's where the transport hubs are and that's where people are waiting for buses and trains, hopefully for not too long. So we can start to get more of a feel of an atmosphere. And again, we can start to do time analysis to say, well, how does this picture change for different contexts? which and it does but uh, happy to go into that in more detail in the Q&A it's worth always thinking about limitations we can get some really rich insights from these mobile data sources and sense data sources but they have their challenges you know how do we respect privacy and gain insights into behavior this is a real tough nut to crack because we're using device ideas here we completely anonymize them in a double way that makes it impossible to identify a person but that's because we thought to be ethically responsible. It doesn't mean another person with a similar data source would follow that kind of criteria. We always have to ask, is the data representative of both the local and visiting populations? And they are two different populations too, which is something to bear in mind. Are all areas accessible for mobile data collection? Because sometimes they're not. And that's for mobile and for example, Wi-Fi. So in the park, it has a Wi-Fi network. I've got a whole other set of examples using the Wi-Fi data, but it only covers the open space. It does doesn't cover the actual event venues, which is quite interesting. Sensor-based sources, a key concern is whether the placement of sensors is creating bias. And we are, have actually started to see this in some towns, for example, with air pollution sensors, where they're not necessarily monitoring the areas at highest risk for people being there for an extended period of time. And we must always ask what behaviours and experiences cannot be captured by these data sources, because we're not getting a complete picture. And we need to be careful of that. We don't just make decisions only on these types of data. But to summarize, you know, spatial analysis gives us those generalized insights and we need those, that's our absolute, without those, we're, we're in danger always with mobile data of seeing what we want to see. So that gives us that baseline. Space time analysis then lets us start to layer up contextual insights. Having a framework enables us to focus on questions rather than data. And we're reaching a point now where this is important. We're, when we have a lot of data, we can dive into it and play with it and come up with all sorts of things, but we need to start with good questions to know what, otherwise we will find what we want from the data if we're not careful. Administrative and land use methods that can give us robust baselines then the sensed and mobile data can give us that dynamic presence and experience. But combining the two together, we go from saying, well, we've got a range of 50 to 
500 mobile devices to actually saying, well, that represents approximately 3,000 to 15,000 people, for example. We must have consideration for bias, privacy and ethics and always, always think about what data is missing. And with that, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, fascinating. And um, there's one area we have been obviously active in with Patrum. Um, and it's really the easy bit is collecting the data. The, the, the difficult bit is using the data. And we've made it uh, public available on the, on the site. And we expect these towns to, to make use of it. But why should we expect them to be, to be able to make use of it? It's not easy, is it? Um, but it's fascinating. And, and COVID, if nothing else, it shows the system works in counting people. Obviously, there are a lot of uh, things that aren't as positive about COVID, but that was one of them. Um, there was one question uh, that came up uh, regarding tourism, because obviously in Wales, uh, the, we have masses of tourists uh, every summer. And would the system be able to tell us the return visits in terms of tourists? And, and so there may be six months between visits. Would it provide that type of uh, intelligence? So one of the challenges here, it comes down to privacy, because if you are storing device IDs, then potentially you could pick up somebody making a return visit in six months time, if you've kept that kind of data. The, the, the bigger question is, can you and should you uh, keep that kind of data? So the way I anonymized within the park is literally, we don't care from one month to the next if it's the same people. Um, deliberately because we don't want to be tracking particularly the regulars and the locals it's it's a sensitive topic for them uh, it was more important to just be able to get an idea of, of do the volumes change does the balance change so I really expected with the mobile app data it would be overwhelmingly uh, locals um, I thought it was because it's quite a small number of actual mobile devices and I thought it's going to be the same people coming to the park on a regular routine and actually the data didn't hold that out it was most times it was about a third to two thirds infrequent people within a single month and I've got several months and for each month it held and then obviously it goes right up for the events so one aspect is you can but from an ethics and privacy perspective you need to be thinking very carefully how if you're literally wanting to identify individuals versus being able to identify the balance of tourism so the fact that obviously in some towns they're likely to have an extreme weighting towards tourism at certain times of the year that then drops dramatically at other times of the year and you might actually want to be rebalancing that for example if you've got a cluster of towns that are working together and one may be being overwhelmed with traffic and congestion there might be some smart ways you could look at trying to rebalance that tourism by having the data which goes back maybe to what ed was saying earlier on so fascinating thank you very much um sharon so our last speaker now is uh, polly barnfield who is the chief executive officer with maybe the title of uh, polly's talk is using social media to drive thriving a thriving high street so thank you very much and over to you polly hello um can everybody hear me and see me all good perfect um, so I can try to myself. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, what two fascinating talks. Um, so yeah, maybe is all about saying how can we listen to the conversation that's going on in the place um, to support our high streets. Um, we work with the High Street Task Force, um, and we collate the data from about 3.4 million businesses across the UK um, by climbing around Google Maps. Um, we pull all the data together and we go back every night and collect all the data from Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Um, we then pump that data out into um, dashboards that um, we've actually, we're in the position now, we've got 3.4 million dashboards to, to get into the hands of businesses. Um, and we've turned that same data into public facing guides for 3,600 towns, which we need to get distributed to. Um, we are currently working with Visa, MasterCard and Amex to then connect all of the transactions in a town back to that data, which is really interesting because it means that what will happen when we're allowed to get back on the high street, that a consumer will be able to make a purchase on a high street and will immediately be able to say, hey, would you like to see what else you can buy nearby, or purchase nearby you? So we believe that by taking social data, linking it with place data and connecting it to spend data, you could overlay against gate great sets of data like, like um, footfall. Um, because as a consumer, I don't see any difference between online and offline. And I think our, our enforced period during lockdown will further reinforce that, which is that, you know, the, as consumers, we see no blur. And as places, we've collectively got to have the infrastructure to be able to bring people back in 
um, but be able to um, combine them by linking existing data sets. So this is how we're using the data today to help high streets, um, but there's all sorts of opportunities to link it with other data sets as well. So um, we have um, launched a nationwide program designed to help UK high streets recover from COVID, which is all about making places shoppable. Um, and uh, we work with local authorities and bids up and down the country to provide them with uh, a tool set that lets them um, have a set of a, a, a shopping guide that's updated constantly. It's not just a shopping guide, it's for all the businesses that are, that are in a place, whether they're open only online right now, um, and when they're open physically as well, it'll be even better. We've got the infrastructure in place to reward shoppers. So um, when they buy in, in a place through a Visa or MasterCard that can be, li that, that can be linked back to a transaction, um, that a bid um, can see or a local authority can see. So uh, working with the Reopening High Street Safety Fund, for example, it's very clear that what people want to be able to demonstrate the value. So we can demonstrate that you've done a thing and you've delivered spend in a place, which again would be amazing to link, link back to footfall data, which is what we're working with the High Street Task Force on is to provide that dashboard that shows what, how social media data is linking uh, and impacting physical footfall data. And then the underlying piece of all of this is that we help places um, increase the skills of their businesses because the rather frightening number, which I'll come on to in a moment right now, is that less, that only 28% of businesses are active on social media. And when you stop and think about that at a local level, and when you stop and think about that for the moment, it's, it's pretty worrying because 3.8 billion people, 66% of the UK, are spending about three hours a day on social media. So as a local business, if you're not using social, you're not gonna have the tools to pull um, customers back into your place. But importantly, it's the data that, that comes out of that. So let's look at what we can do with that um, from a, what I call a consumer perspective. Then we'll look at how we provide business focused tools as well. So um, the local rewards element maybe says that we can make every high street shoppable, both online and offline with virtual guides. And the key thing about these guides is they're populated um, automatically based upon local social media content. So nobody has to create anything. We take the content that's already out there. Um, because we've got, we, we link all those businesses by Google, Google Maps, we can create a boundary and say, right, let's have a guide for this area. Um, and those areas can be defined by, by local authorities and bids. And that data is then linked by Facebook Messenger to transactions through Visa and MasterCard, which is, turns every Visa or MasterCard transaction in a store into a local promotion. So you buy something in one place and it promotes a sale in another. Um, I'm super excited about that. Um, and um, yeah, just we're dying for everything to open again as everybody else is. Um, we have ready my town guides for 3,500 town uh, high streets across the country and equally individual high streets can say, oh, I'd just like to create a little one from, from my area or shopping centers. But what we're doing is collating all of the data from those businesses in the area. And then there's also a set of tools for people to overlay um, specific rewards on top of that. So for any reason, the business doesn't want to have an Instagram account, they can still use local rewards by putting data on over the top of that in the form of a local reward. But they say, if you come into my store today, you get a free cup of coffee with five sticky buttons or whatever it is. So really nice, easy to use digital tools that link people and places together. Um, and we provide a whole raft of physical assets that use the, the, uh, the only benefit of COVID is we've all learned how to use a QR code and all the QR codes linked to physical guides. So we provide the technology, the platform, the local rewards, the QR codes, email activation, the onboarding campaign, the whole thing, and the, the campaign for places to deploy. Because every, 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 if every place has to do this, it's an awfully, it's a, it's a huge task. And we've built the pipes and you just need to plug it in. Um, but underlying this is the skills gap, which I think is, is a, as I mentioned, a, 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 bigger, a bigger agenda. What we're finding um, in the places that we're working right now is that by putting all of this social data into a public facing guide, businesses go, oh, I'm not there. And well, they're not there because you're not on Google My Business and you're not, you haven't got an active Instagram account, which you should have because that's where the customer is. And if you can make all the businesses in a place become more digitally active, the place gets, has a benefit too. Because the more businesses talk to their customers on social, the more business they do. And we've got massive data to prove that. So for the 28% of businesses that are active on social media, we provide the tools and the training to help them go faster. But most importantly, we, might, we focus on sharing their successes so that others can follow in their footsteps. Because this is about getting people to believe they can do it. Getting businesses to realize that they need to talk to their customers, they need to remain connected to their customers, and they need to invite their customers to their business, whether that be online or offline. 
this little glimpse of the sort of case studies we've got. Um, and what's really fascinating is the more we do this, the more we realize that one tiny change can have a massive impact on businesses. And we, may, we, we, we work very hard to get businesses to reveal revenue numbers to us. Lots, lots of businesses don't wanna do that. But this lady on the left, for example, she's learned how to use social over the last two years. And on the second lockdown this year, she in six hours did a very, very large seven figure sale. Um, but just because of one thing she'd learned to do through social. We've got a, another business who's working with, uh, um, actually with the Cotswold um, District Council, who was going to show close two of her three stores. She learned how to do one thing on social media and she started earning an extra thousand pounds a day through lockdown, which has meant those three stores stayed open. But most importantly, this lady on the left for the shoe store, she's a reason for people to visit Cheltenham. Um, and I think it's this, this whole idea that if you can improve the individual skills of, skills of a business, you collectively improve the footfall of the place. Um, and you know, while we're all shut, the ability to actually get a, to deliver footfall, you know, digital, physical foot, a digital footfall to those businesses is critical too, because if each of them individually have to go and buy their customers, it's really expensive. So how you can support businesses through lockdown is really important as well as once we're open again. Um, so we work with a raft, raft of businesses, um, thousands of them, helping them find the one thing that make a big change. <clears throat> so we do that through the Maybe platform, which is what powers the local rewards. And what we, what we turn all of that social data we collect into engagement tools and tools that you can compare performance. So the shoe lady, for example, has learned how to do this by comparing her data to Gucci and Russell and Bromley and thought, well, actually, I haven't got an agency, but if I follow in their footsteps, can I do better? And by she has she just done that? So just by using her own iPhone and shooting pictures within in her own home, she's watched how other people are doing it and has is now absolutely crunching her numbers. She's actually sold more shoes this year than she did last year, and she's in a top end bracket that shouldn't be selling during lockdown. Um, but it's all about being able to understand what's working. So everything we provide lets, lets businesses see what's working, what's not working, what's working for their competitors, it lets them compare their data against somebody else's. And that at a town level, it lets you understand what's the best post in a town, how you can engage with all the businesses in the town. And critically, it gives you trackable spend. It makes digital turn into spend. You can see what's actually been spent on the high street because of the link we have with Google Visa and MasterCard. Uh, I'm not begging to bug you, Amex and MasterCard and Visa. It means you can see the spend in store as well. And so you can say that online promotion has driven me that spend in store. And importantly, you can see that at an aggregated level as well across the town. So our aim right now is to get our dashboards into the hands of the 3.4 million businesses that we've, we've created them for. Um, because if a business can understand today, particularly in lockdown, what are my customers saying? How do our customers feel? Who's influencing their buying decisions? How can I engage with all the people in a place? Because those people still exist. It's just they're not, they're not out and about right now. They're all living in social media. So getting consumers, get, getting businesses to connect consumers through social media is a way for them to drive their sales. Local rewards is a way for us to aggregate that together at a place level, so that as a local authority or as a business improvement district, you can, you can promote the businesses in your place. And most importantly, through local rewards, you can then look at what's the impact of social media on our sales um, and what's, what's the impact on town-wide spend. Because if every business has to promote themselves to, um, as we, as we come out of lockdown and start to recover, it's, it's very expensive. If you can start to, to collectively promote a place, it will help all of the businesses within them thrive faster. So a dashboard for every business that shows them what's working, what's not working. Um, we make reporting a breeze um, and enables everybody, particularly while they're remote working, to be able to see their data as well. So if you can understand what your customer's saying, see how you're performing, get on the same page, manage your town rewards, we believe, we can help businesses recover faster. I work with a wide range of authorities across the UK um, and it's, it's an absolute pleasure to see so many authorities being to embrace how they can create additional infrastructure for places. I think what's the most fascinating part of it is how you can see so many different layers of data, both from the perspective of um, from a local authority to be able to see the impact they're creating, but then see those success stories emerge at a local level and see how individual businesses are sprouting their digital wings and then delivering themselves revenue that is game changing. But collectively, that is what makes each place become more digital. I believe that consumers desperately want to shop local, but they need to be able to find their local businesses and we're all about making that happen. So thank you very much. Um, 
Thank you very much, Polly. That's um, again, it's fascinating. Um, before I hand over to, to Linda um, for the Q and A, I had one question: Do you have any customers or uh, towns in Wales that are using the system at the moment? Um, do you know, interestingly, we are not. We were talking to Owen Davis, um, who is a High Street Task Force expert. Um, yesterday, I think, who's very keen to see a rollout, um, and we've got a sort of big conversation going on. Um, we're in Scotland, but we really ought to be live in Wales. Okay, well, maybe after today, there'll be uh, people queuing at your door. So uh, thank you very much. So um, on that, I will hand over to Linda for the Q&A. Thank you, Linda. That's great. Thanks, David. I, I think it's been fascinating. Um, and as Polly said, there, you know, there's just so much uh, different types and aspects of data that we've seen from uh, more static to dynamic to the social data and how they all come together. I'd really like to come to Clive, actually, to, um, uh, to hear his perspective on what he's heard today and on what that might mean for Wales. Well, certainly from a, a sort of small town mayor of a population of 4,000, I thought all three speakers are excellent. It's another level to what we're doing, you know, uh, with what Ed said with the, the, the data that he has. Uh, what we did in a simplistic way was create something called a place plan. Um, and we just used uh, the data from the, the system we have to generate this, the spatial information that we know what we needed to spend on budget and policy. Um, and then we've got three linked communities to the main urban part of Cardigan. and we've got uh, three villages on the outskirts. And so at the moment we're doing like um, what they call active travel for those that are from Wales, looking at active travel um, inquiries and um, engagement to see what's needed in terms of the links between the towns. But the data we don't have is how many people use buses and things like that. We don't have that information about what kind of uh, pattern there is between uh, the villages and the time of day and things like that. So, you know, this sort of stuff is really fascinating uh, in terms of, of of that sort of thing. And then with with the, what uh, Sharon presented, very similar stuff to what we're doing, but again at another level. Um, <laughs> uh, we we have a, a single active area, which is the town. Um, and uh, but I'd love to be able to break it down to look at the heritage element of the town to see how much that attracts new visits to compare to the shopping area and also to to the the more uh, sort of uh, suburban part of, of, of the town. Uh, for example, and it's just a key, key point from my point of view is that um, at the moment I've, I've, we spent about 50 to 100,000 on redeveloping play areas in the town and I'm just finishing off a second project now uh, and I'm only basing it on footfall. So I don't know the kind of demographics and frequency of use and things like that. So I don't know enough about that, but hopefully, you know, uh, and being able to get more information on how, how we do that, that, that would be able to uh, influence how we do policy and budgets in, in the town. Um, but it's, it's great to see uh, the, the level of information that is possible. You know, we, we use dwell time and footfall and we can see the patterns and the tourists when they come in and when they go um and so we, we you know base our decisions on that so and on that by the way that what we do by the way in case you didn't know we, we send out information to all the businesses uh, there's 120 shops uh, in cardigan and they all get information every month um which is translated this data into footfall and you know frequency dwell time how many people are coming into town how often they're staying there and things like that so it's fascinating that this level of information and then with with what um uh polly had then wow <laughs> um and you're probably right about um the the 28 percent. i think that's true here um from a local perspective um and uh, probably parts of other parts of wales um you know i saw one sh clothing shop uh, suddenly become much more active social media wise and she started doing a fashion show on instagram and on online and she's now been on tv twice as a result of doing that uh, and so it's it's brilliant that They've now grasped the nettle of, you know, being frightened of the internet. I think he's going to be a competitor to the high street, but instead they've embraced it and said it's just another channel to market for them. And and what I'm excited about in in the year ahead in terms of the context of the town is that so much more is happening online, um, that now becoming more aware about. Um, in, uh, Instagram and Facebook and things like that and they're doing much more click and collect going on at the moment something that didn't happen two years ago or uh, even last year before COVID so this accelerated 
um, that sort of channel to market and the online side for, for the town, definitely. And I'm quite excited that that then would be a draw to the town. I think you mentioned, uh, one of the speakers mentioned that there are people who are quite good on, on social media and then attracting people into the town. And there's a secondary spend happening there because they've attracted those people into the town. So yeah, really, really good and fascinating. I've learned a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great, yeah. And, and actually, um, I just wanted to come back to a, a couple of the questions that we've got. Um, so one of them that's been posed is around um, uh, coming back to actually what Ed was saying about using that spatial analysis for certain purposes. Um, and, uh, and the attendee says, uh, you know, the Welsh Government is also interested in 30% of people working from home within their communities and, and remote working hubs. And um, presumably this tool could be used to suggest where these hubs could be located to have maximum impact. So, so I think that's a, a really interesting thing to discuss around uh, uh, the, the, you know, is, is work a missing component of the high street and actually strategically where should you cite those hubs to be very complementary? Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, in, in the context of uh, where we are here, um, I think that we lost Clive. Clive, you've gone on mute. Yeah. Uh... There we go. Sorry. Hello. Um, yeah. Let me just get rid of that. Yeah. In the, in the context of where we are, you're right. Um, looking at footfall and things that like generally, you know, in the other town centre would be ideal for, for our situation, uh, remote working or within two or three miles, you know, if we can avoid using the car. Um, so again, the link communities in, in Cardigan are all within two or three miles from the town centre. We've got this green space around the town, but there are these the commuting villages that we have, there's three of them. Um, so I'd happily cycle into to Cardigan, to, to the hub, just to be to have some social life, you know, <laughs> be able to mix and share a photocopier. <laughs> um, so that, that would be ideal, really, and, and, and the bus routes. And it, it's, this information that Ed is providing would be ideal for what we're, we're looking for, definitely. Yeah, and, and Ed, I don't know if you want to comment on that. I know um, we, when we had the briefing call, it was uh, one of those um, things we discussed, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the thing that um, we had been thinking about during lockdown was, um, yes, yeah, some people are able to work from home and it's OK, but not everybody can. Some people have to go back to work. But um, the big questions, I mean, if you look at a big city like London, it's where is then the risk of people coming to contact? It's places like public transport. So how do you work with a reduced capacity? How do you still allow people to get to work when they really have to? Um, how do you um, kind of reserve or protect public transport for people that have no other option? Because you can get people to walk and cycle, but that, and that's fine if you can walk or cycle, but if you can't, then you're stuck as well. Um, what we looked at was, where were there naturally parts in cities which were easy to get to by public transport, but also by active and public transport, or oh, sorry, by active transport. And if you get this, um, I mean, the, the idea was that you might live on the edge of a city, you might need to get a train in a certain distance. And then when you're close enough to the center, you could cycle the last two kilometers or five kilometers. And so there are strategic points in cities that you can find where the public transport network happens to intersect with a bit of the street network, which is more walkable. And that transfer from one mode to another can be an opportunity. Um, you might get people transferring and keeping on moving into the centre, but you also might get people staying there. Um, if you look at London, those places tend to be local high streets. Um, one of the really interesting things is um, would be to think about, um, could you start to make small scale shared workspaces in those hubs? And there's then going to be a kind of a longer term question, which is, at what then is the the kind of future role of high streets and for a long time they have been quite focused on retail but if they're the parts of the city that people or parts of towns and places that people naturally walk through on their way to someone else they're really places that encourage social interaction and it's just that retail uses have made the have really exploited there being people there to be able to have shops and sell things to so i think there's a really interesting long-term question about what's the future of high streets as retail, some of it does shift online, what then happens to those spaces which are left? Do they become more social? Do they become, is it about different kind of work? Is it about um, a new mix of part working from home, part working around other people? And I mean, there's what one of the things that COVID has made really clear is just the benefit of being in the same room at the same time as other people. And that's really, really difficult to, um, for a whole series of 
different types of kind of creative task it's just really really difficult so i think there's there's an interesting question about how do all those things come together and how do we look at high streets in the in the longer term as well Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks very much for that, Ed. And then just uh, going to another question, which actually I think um, uh, goes on to what, what Sharon was talking about as well, was um, what what city or town data do you wish existed that would help your model? And, and Sharon talked about, you know, that thinking about the data that's missing and, and actually to any of the panellists, um, you know, what what data uh, would would you like to see that would really enhance these models? Um, I could speak at first if you like. Um, I think, I mean, I, my interest is ultimately in mobile data and sense data sources, you know, and looking at ways we can build models from them. But I just think in terms of driving policy decisions, we need to be aware that they don't give us everything. So there's a real push at the moment for big computational models of massive amounts of, com you know, quantitative data. But actually, it's still worth investing some time at getting into that qualitative data and the more traditional means of acquiring it, whether it's through surveys, through people on the ground, asking people, getting to the people that maybe aren't being captured when you are sensing effectively somebody carrying a mobile device in their pocket and it being picked up by sensors around the town or because they've installed an app that will share readings so that you can start to do some kind of spatial analysis. We know that's skewed heavily towards younger people and towards professional people. So it's good for generalizations and it's good for targeting services that also they need, but that doesn't make an entire town. So we need to still think that there's probably going to be a number of traditional means uh, to acquire data for other groups that aren't as well represented. And unfortunately, that does mean that it's generally the challenge is it's more expensive to get that data. You know, we can get we can install an app, app and then we can generate millions and pounds, millions of records and analyze it very, very cheaply. Whereas to actually have researchers on the ground, you know, that are qualified to be able to have the kinds of conversations to get those insights becomes a lot more expensive. The benefit though, of the mobile data is it can help drive the questions, you know, in terms of you can start to learn the footfall and the dwell spots and the areas that are being used or the areas that are not being as used as you expected to. And that can then help frame the sorts of questions you want to ask at a more qualitative level. So you can actually lead to better quality surveys as a result, rather than starting off with going, mm, what questions should we ask? So use that mobile data to help structure a better survey, but certainly from policy decision making do still consider there's going to probably still be some more qualitative approaches needed yeah that's that's a really good point actually to be very inclusive about um you know where we're getting the the data and who we're getting the data from i think is, is a is an important point. Um, I'm very conscious of time. Uh, I think there's just one last question um, that I'd like to pose uh, re the, the social data to Polly. Um, and it was a question about um, the 72% of businesses not on social. Um, you know, what are the reasons do we think in, in Wales uh, is for that? And, and perhaps between Polly and, and Clive, you know, you might be able to start to answer this. Is it lack of, of poor con or, or poor connectivity? Um, or is it other things? Um, certainly we've touched on the skills aspect there. So Polly, I don't know in general whether you want to talk about that and maybe Clive specifically. Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, look, I think it's, uh, you know, as individuals, um, we're all happy using social media. And we, you know, we use it to sort of greater or lesser extents, but suddenly when you're talking as a business, people, it's almost, it's almost like sort of 30 years ago when, when only a few people in a business had a phone, you know, it's given to one person in an organization or it's given to an agency. And actually, it's a very personal thing. And a biz businesses have to become social. It's not something you just outsource. So it is genuinely a skills gap of people just not understanding how to sell using this channel. Um, and you know, consumers have run off the pitch of the ball. They're now living in this environment that businesses have not really entered. And the longer they're not in it, the, the, bigger, the, the, the bigger the perceived barrier is. So the key thing that that we do and the reason we work with High Street Task Force is that we, by collecting all that data, we say to people, look, it's not actually about what you post, it's about how you respond. So, you know, life's a conversation, right? And social media is just a place to have a conversation. So we believe that by being able to aggregate data together, show towns what they look like, and somebody goes, well, I'm not there. And you go, well, no, you're not there because you're not, you're not part of the conversation. And if you, don't want to, if you don't want to post something today, we'll just join the other conversations, join the, great, jo join the conversation the restaurant's having and make it more matter of fact, because social media is not about what you say, it's about how you engage. 
um, and it's 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 a, it's a, it's a skill that businesses need to learn at scale. Yeah, totally agree with that. Um, it, it's I don't think it's infrastructure. Um, you know. Uh, People think, uh, you know, it's the broadband and all that. You don't need that kind of bandwidth. And we've got it now in Wales, I think. It is skills. Um, I'll give you an example. Over Christmas, I did a, a campaign uh, where I promoted all the online shops that were available in Cardigan. And I got bombarded then by people saying, well, my shop's on, not on there. But I said, well, you haven't got a shop. You've got a Facebook page, but you're just saying what your sister did and things like that. Um, you know, it, it wasn't a business-focused Facebook page. And so suddenly they realize I'm not there in the context of my business and they sort of sharpened up a little bit then. And so that added um, um, sort of to the, to that sort of channel to market then in, in the town. So, yeah, I think it is a skills gap. Um, and um, I know there's Superfast Business Wales uh, are sort of trying to fill that gap with, with their, what they're doing. And also before many years, something called Opportunity Wales, which helped the whole e-commerce agenda improve in Wales as well. So, yeah, I think it's down to skills. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much. Um, we have uh, quite a few more questions and we'll uh, aim to get those answered for you. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand back to uh, David. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Linda. And uh, yes, so just to reiterate, we will respond to all the questions and throughout the whole uh, Masterclass series and uh, circulate them. Also, we'll be providing all the talks online. So we're separa separating them into individual talks as well. So you could uh, listen to individuals as well. So our next webinar is on February the 11th and it's titled The Internet of Things and, and Data for a Smart Town. Um, and we'll be posting uh, something on that uh, very shortly. So to finish off, I'd like to thank Ed, Sharon, Polly and Linda for their talks. It's been a fascinating, a lot to take in and process um, and see how we can apply it to, to Wales. So that's the, the, the task ahead of us. Uh, also for our supporting cast, uh, we have um, Sarah from The Hub uh, sitting quite far away from me. Um, we have Peter, Darlene, Matt from Welsh Government who have been supportive throughout. So, um, and on that, um, it's a bit hackneyed, but stay, stay safe and uh, we'll see you in a month or so. Diolch